Welcome back. Welcome in. This is Country Roads Confidential at Earsports.com. I am Mike Casaza welcoming in Chris Anderson to talk a little college basketball. We'll detour here from spring football, which is right in the middle of their, their period of practices here before the spring game. Talk a little basketball, which is, well, Chris, not quite in the middle of the portal season, but a formative phase for sure. We're starting to see some things shake out for a lot of the teams involved and certainly a lot of the players who are becoming involved. This would include West Virginia, a team that figures to be a player because it has so much it needs and wants for its roster. We mentioned uh, Eric Stevenson is on the team or on his way, I guess, but has committed. This will be his fourth school in five years. I'm still trying to figure out how we pulled this off, but I'm impressed. And we're getting some other names of, of candidates it's a really long list, though. What do we think about the number of players that are connected, according to social media, to West Virginia? I think it's the proper way of approaching things. Kind of a shotgun approach, if you will. Uh, throw out a bunch of, of, of feelers, see who's interested. Um, maybe not tie yourself down because this portal is ever evolving. It always is, especially right now. I think uh, when we talked about Stevenson a couple podcasts ago, I mentioned that the number of players in the portal has more than doubled in the last two, three weeks, whatever it was since the first number I gave um, when West Virginia season came to an end. So there are new guys entering the portal every single day. There will be some more um, in the next week or two. And, and then I think maybe the, maybe the uh, number of players entering the portal will start to slow down and then you'll start to see guys. Okay. This is who we have as options. These are guys that we need to target and you'll see, West Virginia push harder for some of those top guys. Interesting strategy that they're putting out here in that I agree. I think it's the right thing to do, but just the scope of players from, from, I don't know, lower shelf to the top shelf and a lot in between. I'm still having a hard time figuring out what they're going to do. I think the positions are, let's just get guys. And I wrote about this and I've gotten some feedback from it in all directions, but I really think they wanted to get high end. I guess we would say top shelf players and just figure it out. Um, I'm not sure that Stevens is or isn't that yet. Excuse me, Stevenson is or isn't that yet. I know that his numbers aren't terribly impressive. I just think that he's a guy that's going to fit in here because he's done the first year thing. He can handle it. He can pass it. He plays a little defense. He's not new to major college basketball. That's fine. But you look at some of these other possibilities and they run a range from someone who's like, for example, Kentucky's Dante Allen, big time recruit, but not the the marquee player at Kentucky. I also wonder about the relationship between Kentucky and West Virginia, if that's good or bad at this point. You have some guys in between who have good numbers and they make a lot of sense. And you look at, let's say, the latest name here, which would be the Iowa transfer, um, Toussaint, coming here, taking a look at it. It makes sense in a lot of ways, but doesn't have very impressive numbers, too. So I keep waiting for the big splash or the big guy. You go, yep, that's it. That's where they're going to get points and rebounds, points and rebounds or rebounds and defense or some of the many things they need from a bona fide, you know, all conference, no doubt about a guy. Haven't quite seen that yet, but then again, it's very early too. Yeah. Let's start with Tucson. He was the guy that, that just went uh, Tuesday um, at morning, afternoon, I guess, whenever it was came out that he was going to visit West Virginia this coming weekend, um, a, a Bronx, you know, New York guard. And that's something that, I know a lot of fans have been pushing for Bob Huggins to get back to. He had a lot of success early in his career at West Virginia with uh, those New York style players uh, or just New York players, period, not style. But um, he is one of those guys. He is from the Bronx. He, like you said, doesn't have great stats either. You go back through his career. He's played a lot. He's approaching 100 games for Iowa, um, but what, averaging about four points a game, shooting 27% from three, 40% from the floor. So it's not that you're not getting a lot of offensive firepower there. Maybe that's not what they want, but I think and this is something I laid out on the board. My concern with this is not so much him by himself, but the whole big picture of the guard situation that you're putting together. Because if you're getting Stevenson, who who did average double figures this year, but is certainly not known as some kind of offensive juggernaut. I mean, he scored double figures, but shot 30 some percent from the floor, shot 30% from three. Uh, Then you would add Tucson who again, four points per game this past year, shot 25% from three. 
and Keaty Johnson, who was known far more for his defense than his ability to score. So that has three veteran guards that you're putting in your backcourt, and none of them really are known for you know explosive scoring. And I, I, th- I don't think that's going to solve some of the problems that West Virginia had. Yep. Uh, by the way, we just keep calling him Toussaint. He's not like Prince or Picasso or anything. His name is Joe Toussaint. Um, I don't know why I didn't get it. And I think you copied me by not saying his name, but Joe Toussaint. And again, a guy that I think he reshuffled the board for, for West Virginia a little bit. For example, um, they've been connected with uh, Sears from Ohio State, excuse me, Ohio University, a good point guard, one of the top you know, mid-major players, mid-major point guards, point guards maybe in the portal. And, and it makes a little bit of sense there. But all of a sudden, they're they're rushing him into town. Rushing isn't the right word. They got him here in a hurry for a visit. And that's with the purpose, I'm sure. Maybe this guy wants to get something done. Maybe he likes West Virginia. Because there's something to this here. Now, what could it be? I don't know. But everything you mentioned makes sense to me. Those are good things. I think it's maybe a little bit more generic. And you can find that from other people. So what is it specifically about him and this that matches? He could play that point guard spot. And they don't have a point guard yet. I know Kedrian Johnson is back. I'm not sure how this works with those two together, except that Tucson has started games and played his off the bench and his numbers are about the same in every capacity. Obviously, more minutes, you're going to have more productivity when you start. But if you just kind of prorate things out, even lower minutes because he's not starting. Pretty much parallel production. Good assist turnover ratio, too, which if you're coming off the bench, that's a good thing to have if you're going to be a steady presence there. doesn't have to or want to score, but never really forced up a ton of shots. And that's okay because those teams that he were on, he was on, they were always pretty good offensively. They were a really good offensive team this year, too. And he was a part of that, too. Not scoring, but making things happen. So he's a guy who can facilitate, too. Just seems to make a lot of sense. But as a piece of, of a picture here that maybe lacks that that large piece of the couple of pieces in the middle that really you build around and you make work together, and a lot of this stuff is going to be kind of projecting from from who's acquiring the person. And again, Allen from Kentucky is a really good example. Dante Allen, that's a four star, like a top 100 player in, in a lot of rankings, but had a knee injury, I believe, when he was a senior in high school, which kind of hurt him a little bit with some credibility. So just kind of freshman year, he didn't play, he redshirted. And then, you know, five points, three points his first two years. And didn't shoot it well, but those are also teams that have a lot of talent. Maybe it's just not for him. If West Virginia is connected with that guy and he visits or he even commits, is that exciting or not? Maybe you don't know who he is yet, and maybe he's trying to find that by going somewhere else, too. It's it's just a it's kind of like an inkblot test about a lot of the stuff here, too. And we're trying to figure out not what we're thinking, what the players are thinking so much as what the team is thinking here. And this is kind of the, the fascination and maybe frustration for the offseason right now because we've seen a collection of of a range of players in that division one level, but also the junior college players too. And what's the mix going to be? Are they going to even go after high school guys? I doubt it. Um, but what's the mix of junior college and major college, high major, mid major, low major it does seem like they're gravitating toward people who have major college experience at the FBS level. How much room is left for someone from junior college and how many junior college players could make it if they are really leaning toward that experience factor. You want to talk about the big name, the big, at least the big name in my book. The tallest maybe years too, maybe West Virginia's too. Mm, go ahead. Johnny Broom, Moorhead State. Um, different, a little, a little different situation, obviously, uh, because he, he is entering the transfer portal while also entering the NBA draft. Do I have that correct? Yes. And, and so he is awaiting word back from the NBA, from scouts, all that stuff to see where he kind of fits in, where he would go in the draft, and, and we'll make that decision of, of staying in the draft or returning to school, but also returning to which school, uh, which adds an extra layer to this entire situation. And and this is not a new name. I vaguely remember West Virginia kicking the tires or some people talking about him maybe transferring from Moorhead State last year. Um, and, and now here he is this time around again, available Somebody that West Virginia has touched base with, somebody they've been linked with, averaged 17 and 11 last year, um, and 14 and nine the year before. So it's great defender like, too. Yeah, and, and well, yeah, four blocks a game, four blocks per game this season. So kind of brings that full 
I think if you're you, you just a second ago, you were talking about, hey, you got these guys that are nice pieces, that are good fits, they could work, or a young guy that has some potential. Where's the big name? I think in my book, this is that big name. This is that guy that can score, can rebound, can play defense. He's the guy that can kind of set up everything around him and really change things for West Virginia. It's going to be a highly sought after player. Yeah. I mean, everybody's going to come after him. So maybe location matters. Maybe he's a guy who who wants to go big and play for a team that's going to play for a big prize. Um, the, the first thing I heard about him was Gonzaga. So that's that's kind of the player you're talking about here. Are they out of it? No way. Are they in it? Sure. We'll see. But what complicates this here is they need they need someone like him. Absolutely. How long can they wait on him? You know, and he has understandably unwittingly complicated this for West Virginia. I'm not sure it's his concern or it should be, but they can't wait around. And if he's going to naturally extend this dalliance with the NBA until June, I believe, right? Mm-hmm. Or even let's say in the May, let's say he, he combines it and just, eh, and, and doesn't work out and he comes out. Um, that's a long time for now too. And if you're, if you're looking at junior college guys who are eager to get somewhere and, and you're considering one or two of them, what if they're both gone and Broom says, I'm staying in the draft, or Broom says, I'm going to Gonzaga or Kentucky or Auburn? Now you're over three, right? So maybe you take one of the two, but you got to say no to another from the junior college targets. And they're they're connected with two. Obviously, we can get into them if we want to, if we haven't already. But um, again, that's a it's a it's a complexity here that I think you have to consider. Can you can you say, hey, pull out of the draft now and come to Morgantown? I don't think you can do that. Can you say pull out of the draft and come to Gonzaga? I think you can. So it's a tricky thing right now about just a player like that. And that may be part of the, the, the thing that we're talking about, about where is that guy that capital G underlined, italicized, bold, whatever guy. And it could be that it's hard to do it right now. Maybe they're in on, on some of them or they're waiting for some people to do something, but a guy like broom will be a great addition at a lot of places. And he might also not even be available too. I don't think he's an NBA player, but good luck talking him out of that. If he gets a sniff of it. Yeah, I think that's that's the interesting part with the junior college players because they're going to want to make a decision and enroll in May. And as you noted, somebody like Broom might not even have to make a decision on the NBA, much less where he wants to play in college next year if he comes back until till June. So it, there, there's some overlapping timelines, a bunch of different layers, all these different things. But it, how about instead of when we fit, let's finish up this podcast, not by the who but the where slash the what, like what does West Virginia need knowing what they have right now, what they could have given their, their, you know, recruiting class, what do they need? Buckets. <laughs> I think they do because we've talked about that. Oh, I thought you were going to say call up Teddy Allen. I thought, I thought that's where you're going there, Mike. What if I told you that, what if I told you that there was a conversation about that? Oh, my God. It didn't go anywhere, but, like, th- there was definitely a conversation uh, in the periphery. I don't think it actually happened in the practice facility at the Coliseum, but – and who knows at what hour of night it happened. But, like, he he had a decision to make as to whether or not he wanted to go pro or, believe it or not, come back for another year <laughs> of college basketball. Um, and let's just say that, like, it was uttered and it didn't go anywhere. But, like, that also alarmed me that he was still – he still had eligibility. But, listen, you need buckets because – um, we Joe Toussaint, good player, right? And there are people like him that maybe they can pick through and say, oh, we like him more than him. They can have a ranking of, I don't know, five to seven point guards that they really like. And if they don't get this one, they move to the next one. You can do that. Size, if it comes from junior college and you develop it, that's fine. There are big players that you can put in there. But like just the the, the skill of getting baskets and, and getting points, which is what this team needs, that's where they got to go. And I think they have to concentrate you know, it's it's begin to Stevens, but they probably got to get somebody who can really shoot and score and fill it up. And then, again, be those big pieces in the middle of the puzzle that you work around. I could not agree more, because even if you look at you look at what's coming back and, and what's coming back, you, you really don't know. A lot of those guys that are coming back just don't have a whole lot of minutes, don't have a whole lot of experience. So you're not entirely sure what they are. You look at the same kind of goes for the guys coming in as well. But you go based off of what they're doing in high school or what they're doing in junior college right now. None of the guys coming in are, as you put it, buckets, just getting buckets all the time. I mean, they can score. Josiah Davis can certainly score. Josiah Harris can certainly score. 
Um, but for the most part, the three guys signed and the one guy committed, all four of them are known more for defense and versatility and 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 not necessarily, I'm going to go out and drop 40 tonight. And I think that's what you need. You need somebody that can create their own shot. You need somebody that can score at will. And so I think that's where the focus needs to be. And that really goes regardless of position. I don't think you need to limit it to one spot. I mean, I do look at what's coming in, what you got. And I think, you know, maybe another guard is, I guess this is where I'm a little confused by the Tucson thing. It's just, you got Stevenson, you got Keedy. You, I assume you have some kind of confidence in what you got with Seth Wilson and Kobe Johnson. So how many more guards do you need? Um, and then, yeah, you, you probably need some big men, even if you do have a couple of those guys coming in. Uh, I mean, right now it's it's essentially a conquo, and that's about it. So get some get some extra bigs down there. But, yeah, just somebody that can score, somebody that can create and score on their own. Would Jake Stevens from VMI do it for you? Or if he was Jake Stevens from VMI, who was born in North Carolina, um, because he's a West Virginia product, um, high school player in the state, went to VMI. Maybe he doesn't matter if he's not from the state, um, but 6'11 guy, pretty good season, shot the three. Just not sure he fits, believe it or not. I'm not sure he fits what they're trying to do right now based on the, the tea leaves that were made to read. Yeah, a, a guy that averaged 29 and three. Uh, this past season and shot 55% from the floor, 50% from three, 49 point something from three and an 80% from the free throw line. That is all good things. But again, this is a, a VMI team that went 500 in the Southern conference standings. This is the guy that West Virginia got a good look at when he came out of Musselman high school and Chose not to. Now, obviously, guys develop. They get better over the course of a few years, and he has been excellent. He will get some looks. He will get some high major looks, I think. Uh, but as far as his fit with this team, like you said, I, I just don't know. I just don't know if that's something they're looking for right now. Uh, the three in his stat line is assists, too, right? That is, yeah, three point three assists. So, so not 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 blocks. That's broom, right? This guy has assists, but again, different players in the the same position here. But I kind of feel like I, he's probably close to two seventy two. So I'm not sure he's a stretch. He's a guy that's a five that bounces out, and that's a that's a tough sell after what we saw this past season. I'm not sure, but we'll see. Time will tell, and there's a lot of time to tell a lot of stories here about the transfer portal. We'll be here to cover them all. But stay tuned. I have a feeling this is going to be one of those things where a lot of players are popping up as being connected to West Virginia. And promisingly, in the case of Broom, who's got a ton of suitors, to mention West Virginia in the same sentence with some of those big-time schools, um, that's a good sign. So we'll keep chronicling them and keep coming back to discuss all of the names and possibilities as this unfolds. Until then, I'm Mike Casazza. And I'm Chris Anderson. We will talk to you next time.